live from Los Angeles, it's theCUBE, covering Open Source Summit North America 2017. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation and Red Hat. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in LA for the Linux Foundation Open Source Summit North America. I'm John Furrier, your host with Stu Miniman, my co-host. Our next guest, Jim Zemlin, Executive Director of the Linux Foundation. Runs the whole show. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you. Thank you, thank you. Um, great runs event. the whole show is a little bit of an, <laughs> of an overstatement. <laughs> well, certainly great keynote up there. I mean, thank a you. lot of things coming together. Just some structural things. Let's, give, let's get the update on what's going on structurally with the Linux Foundation, Sure. one. And then two, the keynote today, this morning, really kind of laid out the state of the union, if you will. Yeah. And um, all cylinders are pumping, no doubt, on open source. Yeah. So give the quick update on kind of what's going sure. on with the Linux Foundation. Sure and then let's get at some of the trends inside the uh, open source community. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, our organization has grown quite a bit uh, in the last few years, as evident by all the people who are here at this event. Uh, but, you know, our focus is really on the projects that are important to, you know, the stability, security, and growth of, you know, the global internet and of, uh, you know, large scale systems. And you know, when you look at Linux or Node.js or things like our networking projects which are powering the production networks for three and a half billion people, uh, you know, what we're really focused on is making sure those projects are healthy, making sure that they have great developers who write incredible code, that it's used to power things like China Mobile's network or AT&T's production uh, network. And then those firms are employing the developers who then write more code, you get more solutions, products, services based on Linux or whatever, more reinvestment, lather, rinse, repeat. It's that cycle we're trying to promote. So before we get into some of the stats, structurally, I know this show, we've KubeCon was out there. Clarify the, the structure, how the shows are rolling out, how are you guys putting sure. together the big tent events and how yeah. developers can get involved in specific yeah. events across but yeah. now there's a ton of projects, but sure. just at a high level, what's the structure? Yeah, so, you know, uh, and I'll throw out a few stats. We have about 25,000 developers that attend all of our events, which are all over the world. But we have our open source summit, which is really sort of a summit to come together and talk about these big picture issues around sustainability, to allow for cross project uh, sort of collaboration. We have project specific events, so uh, the Cloud Native Con, KubeCon event, which yep. is coming up in Austin, yep. which is going to be blowout. You know, I mean, I'm expecting <laughs> thousands of people. I think probably have I mean, more platinum people. sponsors than I've ever seen in any project before. So Huge it's crazy demand. Yeah, yeah. You know, you get it while it's good, right? It is, you know, all these things kind of go up and down, but they're on the upswing. Um, so we have project specific, and then in the networking sector, we have the Open Networking Summit, which is sort of similar to open, uh, the Open Source Summit, but much more focused on networking technology, SDN and NFV. And that uh, is going to be in LA next year, and we'll have uh, a US event, and then a European and, and an this, Asia. And this show's purpose is what? Is this is more, is this, how would you, would you position the Open Source the, Summit? The, the, the Open Source Summit is where all the projects come together and do cross, yeah. you know, pollination. Yeah, cool. You know, I mean, Great. the idea here is that if you're just always in your silo, yeah. you know, you can't actually appreciate what you know, someone else yeah. is doing that may improve your project. Yeah. Right. And, and Jim, there's a couple of events that came together to make this, because it was LinuxCon, yeah, Linux ContainerCon, Con, Container and MesosCon is also yeah, co-resident, exactly. so. Exactly, so we just decided after a while that you know, all, all these events could come together. And again, you know, this cross-pollination yeah. of ideas. And they kind of did, they're just different hotels in Seattle last night. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> we finally said, all right, that's like, enough. Like, we yeah. can't call it, it's just going to be yeah. open it's source. It's a big tent event. It's a big tent event, and yeah. it really reflects how open source has gone mainstream in a way that I don't think any of us would have predicted even maybe five, six yeah. years ago. It's pretty massive. Just to quote some stats, 23 million plus open source developers, what you shared on, on stage today, I want yep. to get to your keynote. Uh, 41 billion lines of code, 1,000 plus new projects a day, 10,000 versions, new versions pushed per day, 64 million repos on GitHub. Just amazing growth. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of points to obviously the rising tide is floating all boats. Now I made a comment, I tweeted, like, 
in the spirit of the joke of standing on the shoulders of giants before you, it's like, what shoulders are we standing on now because there's so many projects. Right, right. <laughs> Is there going to be like a legacy, like the du dual star, badge yeah. values, yeah. been around for a while, you mentioned new, old news and you bring up Linus on stage. Right. I mean, some projects are older, more mature, yeah. Groove Swing, Tier One, yep. Meat and Potatoes, some got a little yep. bit more flair and fashion yep. to it, if you will. Yeah. So you got new dynamics going on. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's like the, the, sh the shoulders you're standing on are almost like, like stage diving, right? Where it's just lots of people's shoulders <laughs> that you're being passed around on. But the, the idea here, and, and what we really focus on, is what are the most important projects in, in the world, and how do we make sure we sustain those projects? So those are the ones that you're going to generally see focused on here, like, you know, if you've got, you know, two people contributing to one small repo for a very small project, that's probably not something that's going to be super high profile here. But what we're trying to do is bring together sort of the big projects and also the key contributors. You know, if you look at the distribution of contribution, and, and this is the thing I think if you're a developer listening to something like this, Someone who gives you know, just one commit to a project to solve some kind of problem they might have, you know, that's the vast majority of people. Somebody who does maybe five to 10 commits, you know, a little bit less, quite a bit less. The vast majority of code, people who give 25 or more commits to a project, small group of folks, they're I know, here. I know Stu wants to ask a question. One, one final question on the growth, because this is kind of reminds me of you know, sports, as we like the ESPN of tech here for the community. If you look at the growth, you put a slide that called by Source Clear that showed the projection by 2026 right. at 400 million libraries, at putting it today around, I think, 64 million. Yeah. Um, this is going to be like an owner's meeting. It's kind of like, right. like <laughs> they get together this event because you are going to have so many projects. Yeah. Because this is kind of the vibe you got going on yeah. here. Yeah. The scale is massive. This yeah. is going to be almost like the owner's meeting. But the we're, teams, we're, the expansion's going to be coming. Yeah. You have to deal with that. That's yeah. challenging. We're ready to grow. I mean, we've been working on systems and staffing and processes to help scale with that. You know, we take seriously that that code runs, you know, modern society. It keeps us private, or doesn't, as we saw with the Equifax hack, which was a CVE and an open source project. And we want to be ready to up our game, to, you know, uh, let's say we could have a secure coding class at this very event for the greatest developers who are working on the most important projects in the world. Would that make all of our lives better? Yes. yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and you want to enable that. That's where you're going. That's, That's exactly where we're going. Yeah, yeah exactly Jim, the, the quote that jumped out at me uh, that, that you gave in the keynote was, projects with sustainable ecosystems are the ones that matter. Yeah. How do we balance all this? I, I heard in you know, Linus's Q&A, it was, you know, look, individual's important, but companies are important. You put up a slide and said, you know, there's you know, thousands and thousands of projects. Sometimes we're going to get some really awesome stuff from three yeah. people you know, yeah. contributing code versus you know, the massive ecosystem with all the platinum providers. So you know, yeah. it, it, it's always in technology, it's an and, yeah. and it's very nuanced, but yeah. how do we get our arms around this? How do we know where to focus? You got to think about, it, it's almost it's worth going back in time to understand where the future is going and study innovation theory. You know, Eric Von Hippel at MIT or Kareem Lakhani at Harvard Business School. And you look at the framework, which is you have corporations who underwrite a lot of development by hiring developers who have an equal importance in this and then users of that software. So those are your main constituents and sometimes they're the same people, right, or the same things. They're not mutually exclusive, they're actually re self-reinforcing if you get the formula right and you make sure that the project is in good shape so that it give, gives confidence to industry or society that, hey, we can count on that, you know? I mean, I think Heartbleed and OpenSSL maybe rattled people's cages, like, yeah. hey, can we count on, not just this project, but can we count on open source, period? So we spent a ton of time working with that project to provide them millions in resources, audited their code, expanded their testing, you know, and we learned a hell of a lot about how to support these communities in the most important developer projects in the world and create that positive feedback loop. That's what we're doing. Yeah, and, and, and Jim, it's, as an analyst, one of the things we're always asked is, right, how do I choose the right technology? Where is, you know, companies now, we're contributing yeah. here, so yeah. it's not just I'm putting dollars in, I'm putting manpower uh, into this, uh, and, you know, the foundations, 
sometimes get a lot of lumps from people saying it's like, oh well, people throw money and what do they get out of it? Yeah. I really, I liked what I heard today, you talking about the cycle, and yeah. maybe t talk to our audience a little bit about chaos, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I, I, I thought was a nice, uh, you know, tongue-in-cheek uh, acronym to say how you're actually going to bring order uh, yeah, yeah. to, uh, you know, the, the, the chaos that we see in the yeah, open yeah. source world. Yeah, I think people need to under, uh, I'm going to come to chaos, but I want to answer one quick question about the roles of organizations like ours. Yeah. We are the roadies, the supporting cast, and you know, the plumbers and the, the, the janitors of the system that keep things going, and, and, but the real rock stars are the developers, and they're underwritten by, the, if you think about it, Linux is worth $10 billion. An average kernel developer makes uh, you know, probably, let's say, 150,000 a year. By the way, they make more than your average developer because they're in such high demand. The, the, the role of organizations like ours is such a tiny fraction financially of what is really fueling this model, uh, but it's an, an important one. And what we ask ourselves all the, day, all the time is, why do you need us? What, who cares, right? Like, throw your code up on GitHub, you don't need the Linux Foundation, right? Why do we even exist? And the answer is to do things like this community health analytics for open source software. To provide the infrastructure for sustainability. Sustainability is something that we need to measure, right? How many developers are contributing to a project? Are they from a diverse community so that if one group goes away, there'll be somebody else there to do that work? How much test coverage do they have? Are there code quality metrics that we could look at? Do they have security practices like a responsible disclosure policy, a security mailing list? Have they recently fuzzed their code? Uh, you know, are they a community that's welcoming for people with different backgrounds and so on and so forth? If you don't have a healthy project, you kind of don't want to bet your company on this project by using it in a production system, right? Yeah. But here's the interesting thing. How many people are using that code in production also is a metric for health, right? Because that's where the reinvestment is going to come in the form of developers There's a working difference on between it. being proactive and being jamming something down someone's throat. Right. So you're taking an approach, if I get this right, to be kind of the same open source ethos use some KPIs, key yep. performance indicators, yep. to give them a sense of success. What you want to do- But you're not, an e it's not an edict saying no, no, you need that. No, no, it can't be an edict. What you want to do is preserve the organic innovation that goes on in open source, and get projects to go, and you'll notice that curve of like sort of value to volume goes up and to the left. We could have written it to the right, but we hold, you know, the whole copy left thing we love, so yeah. it goes up and look. How do you get that organic innovation to kind of go from this small project up and to the left, right? Yeah. How do you capture that? Well, give tools to everyone so that they can better self-analyze. Yeah. You get exponential growth with that. Exactly, if you, that's the If key. you try to control, it's linear. Exactly. You bring it to the community, you get exponential growth. Exactly, so we studied a ton of innovation theory, we looked at how we can build frameworks to facilitate this kind of form of mass innovation, and so that's where tools like Chaos, which is being worked on by Red Hat and you know, a lot of uh, companies who want to figure out which project should I work on, how can I spot that one earlier, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and uh, we're excited about it. You know, I always uh, joke, being the old guy that I am in the late 80s, early 90s, and 80s particularly when I was coding, we did everything, we wrote all the code. Right. Um, you bring up an interesting stat and you put the same finger on it, at least for me, and I think this is where you know, a lot of us old timers who had to do all the libraries from scratch, right. you mentioned the code sandwich, the code club, right. the club sandwich, right. how code's being made, and the interesting thing is you find 90% of most great software is done with open source where the 10% innovation is done by, with original code or yeah. original content, yeah. if you will, yeah. and that, that is the norm. That is and absolutely so open right. Open source is now, you call it the code sandwich because you can put your differentiation. Right. And that's a good use of time. That's the meat. That's right? the that's, meat. Yeah. It's not a wish sandwich, as <laughs> uh, to use the old <laughs> the Blues Brothers example. But I mean, look, at the thing is, is that that's dynamic is real. The yeah. code is leverageable. Yeah. And that this is the dynamic. So, is think that 90%, uh, where, where'd the number come from? Because so that, that seems that, really that, high to me, but I love it. I mean, no, no, great. no, so that number came from a combination of Sonotype, SourceClear, and other organizations that monitor commercial reuse of software on a global basis. So these are the folks who are actually working with commercial industry to look at the makeup of their uh, code, basically. It also just, you don't have to go far to look at a Node.js developer is, they're using Node.js, yeah. they're taking packages out of NPM, and they're writing 
you know, they're cutting paste masters, but they write this critical component yeah, that's the important. meat of their application. It's what they're but that's doing. the innovation fabric that's happening. It, it also is a requirement because let's look at a, a modern luxury vehicle today. It has 100 million lines of code in it. That's more than an F-35, like fighter jet, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's an, an, an unbelievable amount of code. Toyota, who we work with, and yeah. you know, our AGL, our automotive grade Linux is in their Camry. Uh, they couldn't write that code on their own. It's just too much. So this is, yeah. and this is how we get to autonomous vehicle control and things like that. I know you had a tight schedule, we'll make one more comment, get your yeah. reaction to it. I made a yeah. tweet and said, it's open bar and open source, and with a reference to all the goodness being donated by companies, Google, TensorFlow, there's a lot of other things coming in these libraries. Yeah. A lot of people are bringing really, really big IP to the table. IOT, and I kind of made an open bar, because a lot of the young kids, they, they think this is normal. Like, well, it's going to get better. Is it going to be more? <laughs> Keep on drinking that open source, because yeah. it's, it's, is it going to be, is this normal? Is it going to be more like this we, in the future? We, because you have essentially real intellectual property, like say yeah. from Google, yeah. being given to the open source communities yeah. as a gift for innovation. Yeah. I mean, that is just unprecedented. Greatness. The, the reason for that is they're not doing it necessarily altruistically, although I think you can take it that way. They're doing it in a way that betters themselves and others at the same time. I mean, you know, it, it is a form of collective capitalism where they've realized my value's over here. It is better for me to collaborate on underlying infrastructure software that my customers don't care about, that's not critical to my system, but I absolutely have to have, and I'm going to focus on data, or I'm going to focus on much higher level innovation. And what that's doing is creating this hockey stick of innovation where as we share more and more and more infrastructure software, and as that keeps moving up and up yeah. the stack, we all benefit. So in the theory of the management, bring a management theory, their theory, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it, is that they're betting on scale rather than trying to go for profits in the short term. They'd much rather share intellectual property on the back end yeah. value I mean, of scale, take and Kubernetes. scale's a new competitive advantage. Exactly, take Kubernetes as an example. The fact that today, and just even a couple years ago, this wasn't known. We didn't quite know where this was going to be. But today, you can take Node.js, build a container, you know, take an application, throw it into a container, and use Kubernetes to run it on Azure, Amazon, Google, or in a private cloud. That, that definition, the ability to do that, unlocks this massive developer productivity, which creates more value, which is more business opportunity <laughs> for all these guys. You know, they're not doing it because they're nice people, they're doing it because they're unlocking market yeah. potential. And they're the real rock stars. Jim, you're doing a great job. Thank Congratulations you. on your success. Thank you got a lot of growth in front of you. Got Thank a lot you. of challenges and opportunities, certainly with that. Yeah. And of course, the tech athletes out there doing the coding, they're the real rock stars. They really they're are. the real athletes. Of course, we get more on theCUBE. Thanks for your support with theCUBE as well, appreciate that. Thank you, thanks All for having me. All right, this is live coverage from Open Source Summit North America in Los Angeles, California. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break.